Okay, uh, functional programming in Python. Uh, I was actually quite surprised that PyData put me in, into the big room. I thought functional programming, that's an old hat. Everybody's doing that nowadays. Um, obviously, it's still interesting. Um, just very quickly about me. I'm a data scientist at um, Ida Lab, a small uh, data science consultancy, and we mainly do Python. And I've only been doing Python for two years now, so I'm actually fairly new to Python. Uh, but I've done a lot of software engineering in different languages. I've used Ruby, JavaScript, um, now also Python, Haskell, and Swift in non-trivial projects. And I've played with Clojure, Scala, Elixir, and Erlang. Uh, so I've seen a few things, and I've given similar talks uh, on the topic of functional programming in a specific language before. For example, this one about JavaScript. Um, and this talk will not be a motivation of functional programming. Others have already done that. Um, it's mainly a how-to of how can you use functional programming in Python. Um, there is a disclaimer to this. Um, Python has a certain philosophy. Python is very approachable because most of the concepts are very, very simple. And many of the things I will show you are kind of going against that philosophy. And um, that means, um, or, or rather, um, I've forgotten this slide, uh, that goes so far that in 25, uh, in 2005, uh, Guido von Rassum um, proposed to remove reduce from the standard library. It was not reduced, it was instead moved into uh, the func tools um, package. But um, what, what Guido said was not having the choice streamlines the sort process. And that's something that I very much disagree with. I don't want to have a language that forces me to think in a certain way, but rather I'd like to have a language that supports me. When I solve a problem in my head, it should be as easy as possible to translate it at a high level into the solution. And for me, functional pro programming really does that. And um, what I hope to be doing is um, show, the, show you the entrance to the rabbit hole, and if you want to go through it, it's your decision. Um, and also, um, for all the code here, I have a Jupyter Notebook um, that I will link in the end, and, and it's really easy to, to run it and play around yourself. And also, don't hesitate to interrupt me if you don't understand anything, because none of these concepts are difficult, but you are not used to them, so they might seem difficult at first. So, what we are going to do is to now kind of build a vocabulary of concepts that we need to look at some, um, yeah, pretty easy but s slightly more complex examples. And um, functional programming involves um, quite a few concepts. Um, we'll go through uh, a few of them, not all of them, mainly the ones that I need to show you examples. Um, of course, purity is a big concept in functional programming. It's not that important for us now, but just so um, you have seen this once, uh, what is a pure function? It's a function without side effects, and uh, the function at the top clearly has no side effects. You put arguments in, get a result out, that's it. And the function below clearly modifies a global variable, which is often not what you should do. It's much easier to think about these clean, small, pure functions. First class functions. That sounds strange, but it simply means that functions are like everybody else. Um, and in Python we have that, which enables us to do a lot of the cool stuff. Um, we can define functions as normally with a def uh, statement, uh, we, c we have also these lambda expressions, and um, we can use the names of the functions as variables. We can assign them to different va variables, and that also means we can do higher order programming. And that means 
we have a function that takes another function as an argument and might again return a function. That's something we can easily do in Python. Um, in this example, uh, we have like these functions are sometimes called combinator. We have a combinator that takes a function and wraps it into a timing functionality. And after this function we actually want to call is done, it prints how long it took. Okay, but we already know that if you've used decorators, that's exactly what they do. So even if you don't know functional programming, many of you have already used it in the form of decorators. Another very important um, concept in functional programming is partial function um, application. And now it's becoming slightly more fancy. But it's also something that's having been thought of in Python. Um, there's this package called functools, um, and it includes this partial function. But uh, quickly back to the example. Um, I might have a function that takes many arguments, and what I want to have is a function where I already applied one of the arguments. In this add example, I might want to have this add one uh, function. I can simply define it with a def statement, um, add one. I get the function that I'd like to have. But what I also can use is this partial combinator, which simply takes a function and some arguments that I want to partially apply. And what I get back is a function where the remaining arguments are not yet applied. So I can call it with the remaining arguments and get a result back. So these are, of course, really toy examples. I mean, who wants the add one function? Nobody. But we will see that having this possibility of partially applying functions is really powerful. And with, with partial application also comes the concept of currying. And it's sometimes a little bit confusing what's currying, what's partially applying. And uh, Wikipedia says about currying, it's transforming a function that takes multiple arguments in such a way that it can be called as a chain of functions, each with a single argument, partial application. And that's really what carrying is. So it's, in a way, the dual concept to partial applications. It creates, from a normal function, you can create, through currying it, a function that can be much easier partially applied. And we can manually curry a function in, uh, by, by wrapping it in this way. We have this binary function again, add. And we just define a new function that takes the first argument and return a new function that takes the second argument to apply both. So again, it's, it's not a fancy concept. It's really simple in a way. And if we, of course, only apply the first argument, we get a function back. If we apply both arguments, um, we get the result back. Now, this doesn't really look nice. Um, the good thing is uh, there are libraries out there that enable you to just curry any function. So we have this curry combinator, uh, and if we call it, we also have, don't have to use this double braces anymore, but we can just call a function with um, an argument and then get back a function that waits for the rest of the arguments. And a really important concept for currying is closures, because why does this work? It seems like when returning this inner function, it somehow remembers this argument from the outer function, this A. And that is called lexical scoping. So each function carries with it the scope in which it was defined, and it remembers the variables. And if it's being called, it just can look up in that scope where it was defined. And basically, every language that has closures supports a lot of functional programming concepts. And currying is really not that arcane. There are actually in the standard library examples 
of functions that use currying. Um, there's this uh, a module called operator, which um, includes a lot of the operators you normally use for arithmetics, like plus, uh, multiplication, division, as functions. But what it also contains is these item getter, adder getter, and uh, method caller. And those are, in a way, constructs to enable you, um, giving you curried constructs like when you want to call a method on an object, you could instead also use this method caller. First call it with only the name of the method, and that gives you a curried function that waits for an object to apply that method on. That is kind of abstract now, but I'll have an example in a moment. And what's also very important in functional programming is these um, functional collection transformations. And there are basically the three most important, which are map, map filter and reduce. And I want to just quickly show them and show the equivalent um, as a list comprehensions, because I guess you are using list comprehensions all the time and maybe not the functional equivalents. So this concept of applying a function to every element of a sequence or iterator is called map. And um, below this map um, function call is the equivalent as a um, list comprehension. The uh, filter function uh, takes a predicate, which is a function that returns true or false for some argument. and uh, with filter, you can filter an iterator and only get back the elements that um, return true for the predicate. And in list comprehensions, you can simply, um, you can simply um, attach an if statement at the end and um, yeah, call your predicate there. And there is, then there is this kind of um, final boss in functional uh, collection transformations, which is reduce, uh, where people often say, oh, I don't understand what it is. And um, the thing is, it's not, not that hard, especially if you see the equivalent. And the argument often goes like, hey, why don't you write out the loop if you uh, can do it? Um, and it's much more easy to understand. But I don't see why this argument really counts. And um, in that same uh, article that I told you about, uh, where Guido von Rossum uh, proposed to remove reduce, he f he's written, almost every time I see a reduce call with a non-trivial function argument, I need to grab pen and paper to diagram what's actually being fed into that function before I understand that the reduce, uh, what the reduce is supposed to do. So I've done that now, once and for all. If you want to grab pen and paper, uh, you don't need to anymore because this is what reduce does. And I just quickly want to go through it with you. So a reduce turns a single object, the square, and a list of objects, those are the circles, with the help of a binary function that takes one square, one circle, into a single square. And it does it by simply taking the uh, squarey thing and the first circle, applying the function, getting a new square, and then repeating that over and over until there are no circles left. And that's reduce. It's so simple. Another very important concept is um, function composition. And um, for example, when you're doing a list comprehension, where you apply a function and apply a predicate to filter, then what you're actually doing is um, composing two functions. You first run a filter, then run a map. And um, we could express that a little bit differently, and here I'm already using this currying functionality. So I could just say, hey, compose these two functions. The first function is filter, partially applied with this predicate. So filter p just means I have a function that filters based on this predicate. So it awaits still the collection to be put in. And the map is the same thing. It's, it's just a function that's preloaded with um, 
this function it wants to apply to a list th that is um, not yet applied. And if we compose these two functions, we get exactly the same thing. We first filter, then, then map, and that's it. So let's look at a first, a little more complex example, a bad CSV parser. Maybe we don't know about um, pandas. Um, maybe pandas is too big, it's not available. So we have this CSV as a text and we wanna uh, get out these kind of records, a list of dictionaries. And this is kind of a very simple um, imperative Python example. I mean, what would you do? You split on the new lines, then for each line you split on the semicolons, then you get the first line out, which is supposed to um, act as the keys for the dictionaries, and then for each row in that matrix kind of object, uh, you just build the dictionary by first, yeah, you have this empty records array and you, for each line you append a new record. Okay, looks good, looks easy. Now, this could be a functional equivalent. And first of all, you might say, oh, there's so much going on, it's, it's strange. The imperative example is much more um, easily to digest. But if you get into functional programming, and I'll um, explain what these blocks are doing in a moment, then uh, it's, in my opinion, much easier to, to grasp on a high level very quickly what, a, what, a, what an algorithm is supposed to be doing. So what we are doing here is at first, of course, we are importing a lot of stuff because um, Python is not really meant to be used functional, functionally. And, um, you probably recognized I'm um, also important this thing called tools. And that is nowadays, um, when I'm doing a private Python project, always the first thing that I import because it provides me with a lot of useful functions, like already curried versions of compose and map. And then I'm using uh, partial and method caller, like, like I said before. And now the second block is actually very interesting. What I'm doing there is I'm building from these very simple functions that I have slightly more complicated but still very, very simple functions. I'm building from little tools slightly bigger tools. Like, um, because the split function uh, on strings is, is not really in a form like I would um, have, uh, want it to have, um, I'm using a partial application on method caller and then, with this split function, I can build functions that split on certain separators. For example, split lines is just split on new line. Split fields is just split on semicolon. What I also want to have, because I want to build the same matrix that we saw in the other example, is a function that can build a dictionary from an array of keys and an array of values. And that is simply Compose, dict, and zip. So dict is a data type, dictionary, but it's also a function, so I can simply compose it with other functions. Zip is a function that, given two um, lists of equal lengths, gives me back a new list with pairs for uh, each index in the lists um, with the uh, right elements. And with this output, dict can work. I can give dict a list of pairs and get a dictionary. So dict from keys and vels is just um, this function that are composed out of two uh, sim uh, simpler functions. And then, in the end, oh yeah, first of all, um, the CFV2 matrix is just the thing that gives me um, this list of lists of uh, strings um, into a matrix. And once I finally have all these small tools, I can really build on a very high level uh, my program. And first of all, I want to pull everything out into this list of lists. Then I pull out the first row of those lists as the keys. And then I map over the rest of the rows 
with a function that uh, builds a dictionary that is this partial dict from keys and valves keys that is already preloaded with the keys. Everybody understands what's going on. I I have a I have a Jupyter notebook and I can in the interactive tile if it, uh, in the interactive part if you want go through these parts a little more in detail. Another example is PySpark, and I think I've seen like four or five sessions uh, um, about PySpark during this Py data. And here I don't want to go into any detail, but just um, uh, draw your attention to these functions um, at the bottom, this map and reduce. And if you have never, never worked with, with PySpark, but come from a functional background and look at the API of RDDs, then you will feel right at home because those are just all the functional um, collection transformation that you expect. So if you learn functional programming, you can basically already work with Spark. Okay, I have a second example that I would not go into too much detail because of, um, of, of time constraints, but I wanted to have it in here. Um, I stole it from someone who, who had a great talk about ITER tools um, at um, a PyData conference in, um, in Seattle. And if you know k-means, or rather if you know the Lloyd algorithm, which is a version of k-means, and you see this, you will definitely say, okay, yeah, that is how k-means works. In k-means, you iterate finding new means, and you're feeding in an initial sample of k points at the initial means. And you do that until this converges. And this really is for me the essence of functional programming. Um, it's very high level functions composed of smaller functions. Um, and if you just look at the main algorithm, you should be able to see and understand and read at a high level what it does. And here I would say um, I definitely do. And one, one other cool thing is that um, a lot of these functions, like this until conversion, it's, uh, convergence, has nothing to do with k-means. It's just a very general function that helps me if I have an iterator run it until it doesn't change anymore and give me the result back. And here's the rest of the code. It's also in the uh, notebook. It's using some currying, of course, um, to make things easier. But what are the main takeaways here? I mean, we've seen functional programming is possible in Python to a degree. And what I hope that you've also seen is that small composable functions are good, uh, no matter if you're using a functional style or an imperative style. But for me, functional programming is exactly that. Build general tools and then compose them. And that makes solving problems, at least for me, much easier. But Python is also missing a few things, at least for me. Um, especially coming from a language like Haskell. Um, there, there's iter tools, which is useful, but there are more functions that, that are really useful, and they are not in the standard library. Also, the Lambda syntax is not really nice. Um, you've seen me only use it once in these slides. Um, and especially if you, if you want to use something like an if statement in a lambda, which you can't, you have to um, go for the ternary operator. And I mean, then it becomes true. Reduce with a lambda and a ternary operator is unreadable. Uh, also, something that we, of course, don't have is automatic currying and a nice composition syntax. I have to use this long compose function. And then there are a few other things like um, algebraic data types or some types and pattern matching, which we don't have in Python. Um, but there are some remedies. 
First of all, others have written these um, more list functions that I complained about. Um, PyTools is um, the one that I chose for um, this presentation, also that I use personally. Um, then there's another one called FNPy, which really looks good, and um, I haven't worked with PyFunctional, but just from glossing over what's there, it also looked good. Uh, the first one, by the way, um, PyTools is by Matthew Rocklin, who uh, gave the keynote of last year's PyData Berlin. In this, um, in this second library, there's an interesting construct that kind of provides a nice Lambda syntax, and if you've done Spark, you, you know this syntax with this underscore, uh, but it's, it's a strange construct and it's kind of fragile. I tried to use it in, when playing with PySpark and it didn't work at all. And there's other interesting stuff uh, that others have done in Python. So there are just a few links. Um, if you're interested in this topic, then yeah, go down uh, that route. <laughs> yeah, just smash it. It's a good idea. <laughs> and those are other talks about functional program, uh, programming in Python where I've stole some material. Uh, there's good stuff out there. Um, and also, uh, at the end, my, my um, own talk about JavaScript, you'll see striking similarities to that previous talk. Um, that first one is actually by Matthew Rocklin, and it's, it's a tutorial on, Python, uh, on functional programming. It goes a, few, uh, a little bit deeper in a few of those concepts. Um, the second one is by the author of fn.py. Um, yeah, and the third one is really good. It's, it doesn't use any of these functional um, programming um, uh, libraries, but just shows what you can do just with iter tools. And if you want to go deeper into functional programming, um, I actually haven't read the structure of interpre and interpretation of computer programming, but everybody recommends it, so I have to recommend it too. But I have read big parts of the other two books about Haskell, and really Haskell is the gateway drug to get into functional concepts. Uh, it's a really cool, cool language. So, um, thank you. Um, that was my talk. Uh, I think I'm quite good on the time. We have time for questions. Um. Do we have people with mics going around? I see hands. Hi, um, great talk, um, thanks for that. So I think you, you left out one of the most important pain points. You had it on the, on the intro slide and it was striked out, but it wasn't in the missing, that was the immutability. And um, I would love to have that in Python, so not seeing it on missing kind of implies to me that you have a workaround. Um, I'd be really interested in, in immutability. Yeah, so um, of, of course you don't have it per se, but what people have done is um, create immutable data structures, um, functional immutable data structures, so that um, if you have something like a dict or something like a list so that you can modify it. I mean, that just a matter of implementing a data structure that prevents you from doing these harmful things. Uh, so yes, people have done that, and I think it was on um, this what other people have done slide. Um, yeah, exactly. So there, there really is no construct for that, and of course you you just have to not do it. Yeah, there's nothing that forces you to um, avoid side effects or even uh, just avoid. A mutating state. Um, so, sorry for that. Uh, 
So a great talk. When it comes to uh, functional programming in, Java, uh, in Python, it's one of rare instances when JavaScript is cleaner, way cleaner, because we can uh, chain things like filters, maps, uh, etc. And for me, uh, the biggest pain point uh, in Python is that uh, this composition of filter and map is ugly. And you cannot g uh, go it with uh, like six uh, things and make it comprehensible. So is there any workaround or it's not much? Um, so in this fn.py, there's another interesting construct, which is mm, kind of a function that's just called f. They call it a functional, and you can use that to wrap functions, and that gives you a, a slightly nicer, nicer composition syntax. But the main point here is definitely it's ugly because we don't have a nice composition syntax. If we had that, it would reach much better. We, now we have to put this compose and then in parentheses and then all the functions as arguments. It's not that nice. In, in Haskell, you simply use a dot and uh, then it's really, really well readable. Um, maybe this construct in fn.py is a solution. Maybe it makes things harder to debug. I'm not sure. I haven't used it. Uh, but you might want to have a look at fn.py. There was a hand in the front here uh, from a gentleman that... Very nice talk. I just saw a quick remark about this pure function. You, you showed this add function, and you said it would be an example for a pure function, but you can only assume it. You, if you overload the plus and you don't know what A and B is, oh, that's that, true. Could, that could be a side effect. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that, there's, um, in, in Haskell, you really have the possibility to separate pure and non-pure code because it's actually encoded in the type system. So, Python is a dynamic language, type system is not an option. Um, I've seen a library, oh yeah, it's on the slides here. Somebody's doing something um, on the separation of um, side effects and pure code. I haven't looked at this, but maybe that would be something interesting for you. Um, yeah. Um, thanks for your talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask about what's your concerns about the underscore uh, construct in PySpark? Um, yeah, so in, in PySpark, the code is mostly not running on your machine. And um, you, you send it off and you have to make sure that you serialize everything. And this serialization failed uh, in the experiments that I made. Um, there are some instructions in the PySpark documentation on, on how you have to package up your code so that basically everything get, can get properly serialized. I didn't really try to find out what was wrong. I just quickly tried it, uh, use this construct instead of a normal Lambda, didn't serialize. I thought, okay, um, not for me. But it might work somehow, but you have to find out how you can, can be sure that all the code you need for this construct is actually on that distant machine and properly serializable and deserializable. Uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of is diff different because the lambda function is, um, yeah, it's a language construct. And this underscore was yeah, a library that I imported from somewhere. So there's a lot of code from somewhere else involved. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure how Cloud Pickle serializes stuff, but it somehow has to walk the abstract syntax tree and find out where was stuff imported from, I would guess. So I can't really give a good answer to that, sorry. Oh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so basically, I come from a Scala background, and then going to PySpark Pi feels a little bit clumsy in the sense that you don't have many of the monads, like you don't have the option monad, and you don't have either. 
So I want to know if there is any of these packages that actually try to mimic that and if you had to use it in production. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, maybe was also some of the things that I was instantly looking for. And um, I haven't found anything that is pretty. People are trying to do it, but it's really, really clumsy. And I've seen nothing that's worth the effort. So um, I think I have to disappoint you, but maybe somebody else has seen something that's actually good. Um, I haven't so far. Just gonna play here the part of the devil's advocate. I was looking at your code and I, I mean, I work with functional programming, Scala a little bit. And when I saw your code, I think if I see that in a really long uh, source code, gonna get super confused. And I also read recently that, uh, for example, they recommend to use uh, list comprehension instead of mapping when you're like generating new data from a list because it's more readable and it's even faster. Um, so I wanna, I wanna know your take on that and how to balance readability and, and, and maintainability and because with that, if you just write code in that manner, you can end up with like data sign and spaghetti code. Yeah, um, I'm not sure I really have a good answer on that. I mean, a big argument against functional programming is that it's confusing, but is it? If you do it all the time, then it becomes less confusing. And we are learning new libraries all the time, so why can't we learn these concepts and get really fluent in them? Um, but Python has this certain philosophy, and like, I, I don't really want to fight with that. Um, and that's also the reason why I don't recommend doing this, what I've done here. And also, you're right, uh, for some of, the, some of the codes I've I've used here, I've really done functional programming with a crowbar. I think a healthy mix is um, a good idea. For example, um, this example that I stole and uh, modified slightly, this is the main function and it's really, really functional and to my opinion, it's really well readable. And when you go down into the function, then you see, okay, there are actually a lot of list comprehensions and like more idiomatic Python. And I think they have no argument against that. Um, but I really think it helps to, on a high level, has a more, have a more functional style. Because to me, it's better understandable. It's, it's more readable. It, if you do it well, it reads like English. And do we have time for one more question? Yes. Thanks for allowing me this last question. So um, have you already taken a look at Hi? Because I think that would be the perfect solution for you. It's a Lisp dialect for Python, which directly translates Lisp syntax to Python abstract uh, syntax trees without much overhead. And it has all those features you need, like function compositions and create lambda, uh, lambda f uh, functions and all that stuff. So it's working, it's a, it's a bit like closure in its uh, syntax style. I, I think we are gonna talk after yeah. this presentation. Yeah. I think you will like this, I, I will talk to you, okay. Okay, so of course, the, the, the big argument for Python, especially in data science, is that we have all these nice, um, these nice libraries like pandas and scikit-learn. And um, being able to talk to those libraries from something that has yeah, better language features would be for me a nice thing. So thank you. <laughs>